that Mary is handing the chat box and is sort of overall in control here. And we have Anna, Dr. Anna Forsman, who's going to be our main speaker tonight. And I'm Richard Baker, uh, president of the Pelican Island Audubon Society. Um, one of the things that we were really concerned about, of course, you all know that uh, the, rep, the Florida legislature is in session now and a lot of things can happen, good and bad. But uh, our, uh, our senator is Debbie Mayfield and our representative is Aaron Garl. And we have just really two really concerns. Uh, there's many, there's the M roads and all kinds of things, but we're, tr we're trying to get the Florida Forever funds brought up to uh, at least 125. It appears maybe they're going to do 100 million, but historically for 20 years, we were getting 300 uh, million dollars worth to buy uh, conservation lands in Florida. And then uh, when Scott took over and then the present governor, they've cut this way back, sometimes less than 50. Uh, we also are concerned that they wanna, you know, pass uh, legislation that uh, takes away the growth management regulations. And uh, so we're concerned about that. And so if we could call Aaron Grell uh, caller or emailer and Debbie Mayfield, the senator, we'd appreciate it very much. Uh, Audubon Advocates programs are still at schools and are doing well. We have four schools that we are, the kids come, each school comes on, a, one comes on a Monday, one on a Tuesday, one on Wednesday, one on a Thursday for 14 weeks, which is the semester and uh, then the second semester, they, we get new kids. These are fifth graders coming. It's working very well. Uh, we have some great videos on our website. Um, all our speakers so far have agreed to uh, put them on our website. So if you want to go back and look at them or if you have friends, uh, you can uh, uh, tell them about it. So you can download all, all the speakers, the great speakers that we've had. Uh, giving our presentations. We also have done a number of videos on native plants and different birds and different areas uh, around. Um, if you can't get out to Blue Cypress Lake, here's a six minute video that uh, gives you a, a good feeling about being in a lake. This is the largest population of ospreys in the world. Nobody has uh, refuted it. And next month, we're going to have an expert on osprey. And we can bring up the question, does he think we have the largest population of ospreys in the world? He's coming from Cornell University. Um, one of the things, this is the migration period. And we have a great video by two of our best birders uh, telling us about the hot spots in Indian River County for looking at especially warblers. Uh, migrating uh, through uh, Indian River County and in the, generally the, the Treasure Coast. He tells you where to go, how to go, and where to, where to find them. There's two, two people that are doing the talking. Great video. If you're interested in birds, this is one to see. Uh, we also have uh, Doug Tallamy, uh, one of his presentations there. And uh, that's on our website too. The, unfortunately, the field trip tomorrow, because of the weather, it's supposed to be raining. Uh, Ricky Ray decided to uh, postpone it. He's going to reschedule it. And those that have signed up, we will be in contact with you and asking if you would want uh, to do it at a further, at another date that he hasn't uh, decided on yet. But there were, we'll get the three week, three lakes, wild, wildlife management area field trip will be done here shortly, but not tomorrow. Um, this is a current press lease. The good news is we don't have to go to Mars. Uh, humans are turning our green earth into a lifeless Mars. So, uh, or we can uh, plant more trees and they're critical for all life on earth. Let's plant more. Why waste a climate crisis? So uh, we, we're, our, our goal is to plant 100,000 trees. Uh, humans have lost about, we humans have, development has lost about 70% of our birds. This is a list on the right hand side of the screen showing about 30 some plants that we have in our nursery down at the Audubon house. 
We're giving free trees away, bald cypress, mahogany, and southern live oak, and then one free plant, the firebush. We have those, and they're all free. The others were charging five dollars a for a one gallon pot. We so far have planted uh, over uh, almost twenty two. Uh, 100 uh, native trees of 16 species here and we've marked them on a, our map, a GPS map where the different tree, all of the trees are located. So uh, uh, as of today, uh, 2,191, we're hoping to get to 3,000 shortly. In addition to the trees, we have uh, uh, added, we've given away or sold uh, 4,722 native plants of about 30 different species. So total, we're heading towards uh, 7,000 species, 7,000 trees and plants, trees for life and plants for birds, and they are marked on there too. Uh, we'll need volunteers, office help would be good, uh, newsletter, folding, stuffing envelopes, etc. Where the air potato is starting to uh, emerge, and so it'd be good to have you help with that. We need some housekeeping, keeping our classroom, bathrooms, and breezeways in good shape. We have lots of good work in our nursery, especially uh, watering our plants on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays mornings at nine o'clock. If you like to lead a field trip, we'd love that. If you want to help with grant writing and fundraising, publicity, and trail maintenance, get, get in contact with us. You can see a form on our website. We have a online store where we sell some books and other things that you can buy the reflection, our Blue Cypress book or the birds Florida Birds Exposed and a couple of others. We have t-shirts there that are really pretty and uh, some other things that you can find on our website. We have a nice library and you can get on library, um, take out, find out on our, on our website, the books that we have by author and title and uh, they're free to take out. We have a new uh, book, you see this, uh, and female Anne Hing is speaking out, calling on uh, photographers, take up the challenge, enter the Pelican Island Audubon's new Birds Need Plants photo contest. And so we're looking for all of you to uh, come up with some great pictures that show birds needing plants. Uh, we are just starting this uh, on Wednesday, the beginning eBird course uh, by Holly uh, Ferreira. Uh, she's with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Biologist and you need to register for it and you can do that online. It'll be on Wednesday, uh, this Wednesday from six to seven. It's a, you can learn so much from taking this class about birds. Uh, on Thursday, uh, we will be giving away free oaks, bald cypress and mahogany trees and firebush plants at the Emerson Center where they're having a talk at seven o'clock on what's happening to Florida's water supply. Uh, it's a great talk. We, we will be there at six o'clock with free live oaks, bald cypress and mahogany trees if you're interested in a tree. Everybody uh, plant a, at least one tree in their yard. Uh, on Saturday is the Earth Day for at Sebastian and uh, we will also have a pavilion there and we'll be uh, giving uh, trees away there also and volunteers are needed at our, uh, at our site. So if you want, you can sign up or call Mary at our Audubon house or at 772-202-8642. The next month's meeting is going to be on off sprays and we're going to have Dr. Alan Pohl, uh, Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology. And uh, so it'll be interesting to talk with him about what we have at Blue Cypress Lake. So we're looking forward to the off sprays talk. And that brings us to our talk tonight. We have Dr. Anna Forsman, a research scientist at the Department of Biology and Genomics and Bioinformatics, University of Central Florida. She got her PhD at the, the Ornithology Lab and I think the Department of Biology too. It, this is one of the, this is probably the best 
department of ornithology in the world by far. And so it's, if you get a PhD from there, it is really something. They have really some wonderful people out there and do, that's where the eBird and all the work on birds is, is done. Uh, so I think she's gonna be talking to us about special relationships about purple martins that have developed along with us humans, what we've done. And it's so good because I don't know anything much about purple martins and, and they're a migratory bird that come up here and it's so nice to have you talk about it. This, uh, is it true that it's a purple martin time? <laughs> it is purple martin time. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Anna, I appreciate you coming up here. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak with you all tonight. Um, I'm super excited to be here and, and tell you about all the exciting work that we're doing with Purple Martins here at UCF. Uh, but before we get into that, since I haven't had a chance to meet most of you at this point, I thought I would start off by telling you a little bit about myself. So I'm actually not from the United States originally. I am from the country of Sweden on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, both my parents are Swedish and I was born there and, and grew up traveling between Sweden and the United States. Uh, we moved back and forth many times. Uh, and during that time, I spent a lot of time outside, um, a lot of time sailing with my parents as a kid over in Sweden and hiking the woods here in the United States. So I think I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be a biologist, um, but I went through a couple different phases of the, um, thinking about what exactly I wanted to study in biology. So for my, my academic um, path, I started out at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and this is really where I discovered my love of birds. I spent a summer doing undergraduate research where I was looking at breeding birds, doing a breeding bird survey in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. And I was hooked after that. I knew that I wanted to do field work, uh, especially with birds. So after I graduated with a degree in biology from William and Mary, I decided to take a little bit of time off before grad school. And I moved up to New Hampshire and worked at the Dartmouth Medical School for two years. And you may be wondering, medical school, why would I be working at a medical school when I've just told you that I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a field biologist? Well, I uh, felt that there were a lot of things in biology that I still needed to learn and I hadn't had a lot of experience in the lab. And so I felt like this was the perfect opportunity to get a chance to learn some new skills and to explore uh, more ideas before I approached a grad program. And uh, I'm really glad that I did because I continued on after that to Illinois State University in Normal, Illinois, where I started working on house wrens. And uh, this was uh, my opportunity to really combine my love for ornithology and also my newfound experience in the lab. And so this is really where I started working uh, using DNA as a tool for understanding avian behavior and ecology. So I use DNA um, for paternity analyses and house wrens to try to understand why both male and female house wrens engage in extra pair matings outside of the social pair bond. Uh, once I finished up at Illinois State University, I went on to Cornell University, where I was in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and of course also at the Lab of Ornithology, which I feel extremely grateful for to have had the opportunity to work there. Uh, I worked on tree swallows and again, uh, used my background in understanding DNA technology, using DNA for um, asking questions about bird ecology. Uh, now I instead use DNA to characterize the bacterial communities that tree swallows come into contact with their in their environment to understand how that influences um, tree swallow health and development and behavior. So uh, I finished up at Cornell in 2016 and ended up at UCF. Uh, I'm now here in the Department of Biology and also in the Genomics and Bioinformatics cluster, which I'll talk about a little bit more here in a few slides. 
so my main study systems are, of course, the Purple Martin and also the Florida Scrub Jay. However, I collaborate with a whole bunch of different people um, in biology, but also in biomedical sciences, uh, working on various questions and various systems, uh, again, using these DNA techniques, mostly to understand bacterial communities that these critters come into contact with, both in their external environment, but also their internal environments, and also using DNA technology to understand diet composition, which we'll talk a little bit more uh, later about in, in terms of purple martins. So I was hired here at UCF um, by the biology department to start their genomics lab, their genomics teaching lab. This, uh, this is what the lab looks like now. It's def definitely a very busy space, or at least in non-COVID times, it's a very busy space. Um, in this space, I teach the undergraduate genomics course, and I also maintain this lab for both undergraduate and graduate students that are working on various independent um, research projects. So at this point, you may be wondering what exactly is genomics? You've said genomics multiple times now, but haven't defined it. So uh, I put this slide in here to remind myself to stop <laughs> and, and define exactly what genomics is. So genomics is the study of the entire genome. And the genome is the entire collection of genes and genetic material um, that you possess. And so unlike genetics, where we tend to study one or two genes at a time, to understand how they function and how they're inherited. Uh, genomics is the study of all of the genes simultaneously and uh, thinking about interactions between genes and genomic profiles uh, across populations. And the, the technology that has arisen here over the last decade or two that allows for the study of genomics is DNA sequencing. And we hear a lot about DNA sequencing right now on the news uh, in relation to COVID because much COVID research right now is employing just this using DNA um, sequencing to understand uh, the genome of the, the virus, in fact, just downstairs, I'm, I'm in my office on campus right now, just downstairs on the first floor, uh, there is um, genome sequencing happening right now, <laughs> looking at the, the COVID virus. So it's a very exciting technology. Um, and it's not only used for understanding um, biomedical issues, it's also applied to understanding ecological issues. And that's really where um, my interests come in. And so I consider myself to be a molecular ecologist because I use molecular biology or the study of uh, DNA or using DNA technology to understand specifically bird behavior and ecology. And um, the primary questions that drive my research are understanding how bacteria and other microbes in the environment influences a bird's development and health and behaviors and interactions with one another and its environment. But enough about me and my interests. Uh, why don't we move on and talk a little bit more about the star of the show for today, which is of course the Purple Martin. So the purple martin is a swallow, uh, which means that it belongs to the family of Hirundinidae, and there are about 80 species of swallows worldwide. Uh, 29 of those species are in the Americas or in the New World. Uh, they're very um, geographically widespread, and so what I'm showing you here is the distribution of the barn swallow. But I, I like to include this, this map because it really does show how widely distributed these species are. Anna, can you speak just a little louder, please? Yeah. I got a request. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the purple martin is the largest swallow in, uh, in the New World, and it is a uh, migratory species. And so in our north, northern hemispheric um, fall is when these birds are, are traveling or flying down from North America to South and Central America to spend the uh, winter time. Uh, and then in spring, they come back here to uh, mostly the United States and into Canada for breeding. 
So purple martins are the largest swallows, as I mentioned, and uh, their wingspan is about that of a, of a standard bowling pin, and uh, they weigh between 45 and 60 grams, or uh, about the size of, of a, a large kiwi. And uh, so I worked with tree swallows before this, and, and the purple martins are significantly larger than <laughs> the, the tree swallows. They weigh between two and three times uh, as much as the tree swallows. They're sexually dimorphic, which means that the males and females do look different from each other. And they exhibit delayed plumage maturation, which means that uh, it takes some time before uh, individuals come into their adult plumage. And so uh, this dark purple uh, coloration here of that the male come, uh, comes into doesn't happen until the second, um, the second year as the second year of breeding. Um, so the first year uh, that, that the males return after um, hatching, they have an immature uh, plumage and they don't come into this darker plumage until they're older. And the same thing is the case for the females, but it's not as obvious as for the males. Purple martins are aerial insectivores, which means that they basically fly uh, uh, and, and hunt on the wing. And uh, unlike some other types of swallows, purple martins seem to prefer to forage at high, higher altitudes. The purple martins will lay between three to six eggs, which they incubate for um, between 15 and 18 days. Uh, these chicks hatch out and they're, um, these are altricial birds and so they hatch out and they're, they're naked and their eyes are closed and they are unable to thermoregulate. It takes about a week or so before they're able to, uh, to thermoregulate properly, which is why the adults will brood those chicks. The chicks stay in the nest for about a month uh, before they fledge. Uh, and um, they will then sometimes spend the night in in those gourds or the the, um, the nesting cavities after they fledged. We have three subspecies of the purple martin. So the subspecies that we have here on the east coast is of course the eastern purple martin, and then on the west coast we have the western purple martin. Like the eastern purple martin, uh, these martins will also use artificial cavities, um, not as extensively as the eastern purple martin, um, but there have been uh, quite a few successful attempts to getting the, this subspecies to use uh, artificial cavities as well. And then the third subspecies, which is probably my favorite subspecies, although I've never seen them in real life, uh, is the desert purple martin. And these guys are super neat in that they actually nest in saguaro cacti. Uh, and so um, these, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't seem like there have been um, any successful attempts yet uh, of um, using artificial cavities for these guys. But I, I think that there's, there's some work uh, being done on this. Uh, in particular, the Tucson Audubon Society, they have a project going on. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about the Desert Purple Martin, there are great pictures. There's a great information about the work that they've been doing, uh, not necessarily in putting out artificial housing, but to, uh, to investigate these birds in their natural um, habitats. So all purple martins are colonial cavity nesters, which means that they're very much attracted to the activity of other birds. And so if you are thinking about setting up a purple martin house, uh, there are some tips and tricks for trying to attract uh, birds that first time around. One of the things that you can do is put out a speaker to broadcast the purple martin song uh, or to put out some decoys uh, so it looks like there is already activity at your house, at your housing. And uh, <laughs> it sounds perhaps a little bit silly, but I have had really great luck, especially with these uh, speakers. And so we just actually put up a new house 
at my own house um, this season. And within 15 minutes of setting up the speaker, we had purple martins that were circling. Now it did take a couple weeks before we had any birds that actually ended up settling, but they are definitely paying attention to these songs um, that are being broadcast. So these are definitely things that I would recommend if you're starting your own colony. So historically, purple martins used natural cavities, so cavities ex excavated by, by woodpeckers um, and that have formed naturally. Purple martins uh, are not able to excavate their own cavities, so they're considered to be secondary cavity nesters. However, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, purple martins of all, well, at least of two of the subspecies are using um, uh, artificial houses quite extensively. And in fact, the Eastern purple martin at this point is using almost exclusively uh, artificial housing. In fact, one of the last places where we know that there was use of natural cavities, which actually right here at Orlando Wetlands Park, just 25 minutes away from UCF, which is really exciting. Um, I have talked extensively with the director over at the Orlando Wetlands Park, uh, and it doesn't seem in the last couple of years that there's been a lot of activity with the Purple Martins. I guess in the early 2000s, um, there were many, maybe as many as 100 pairs that were nesting here at the park um, in these uh, older palm trees that have uh, cavities in them. But I guess a lot of these have fallen down over time, and so they're just aren't as many available cavities for the birds. <clears throat> so one of the projects that my students have been uh, involved with here at UCF is starting up a program, uh, a citizen science program, to scout the uh, wetlands to see if there are, in fact, Purple Martins still using natural cavities there. And this group is called the Purple Patrol. And I'll give some more information at the end of my talk if anyone's interested in participating in that. So purple martins actually have a, a quite a long history with humans here in North America. And so there's, there's evidence going back to um, as early as the um, early 1800s uh, documenting that Native Americans would put out these natural gourds um, for the purple martins around their um, uh, housing areas. And uh, you may well be aware that uh, folks will still use these natural gourds today. In fact, I think I have one here in my office. <laughs> so uh, the gourds now in 2021 look a little bit different. They're made out of plastic. Uh, oftentimes they uh, will have this horizontal configuration that's seen here in the picture. Um, and the reason for that is this longer neck is actually a way to um, deter predators. So aerial predators such as owls and hawks, they may be trying to get in and get their talons into the gourd to pull out chicks. Um, and so it creates just a little bit more distance between that opening to the nest gourd and, um, and the actual nesting area. So uh, yeah, so birds and, uh, and humans have quite a long uh, history together. Um, and we don't really know why this actually started from the beginning. Maybe it was a way uh, to encourage natural pest management. Um, although I've <laughs> shown the picture here of mosquitoes, we actually now know that purple martins don't in fact eat a lot of mosquitoes, but they do eat a lot of other bugs, some of them that um, are agricultural pests. And of course there are non-insect pests uh, as well that uh, could be helpful um, for the purple martins to, um, uh, to keep at bay. Although I realize that this is an oriole here that is mobbing this <laughs> corvid and not a purple martin. It's also possible that the Native Americans just really enjoyed having purple martins around. Um, lots of us today enjoy them, and there are lots of organizations and festivals that go on every year to celebrate this, this awesome species. And there are a lot of folks involved also in community-based science. So uh, there are tens of thousands of folks across uh, North America that will set up their own um, uh, housing 
uh, housing units for these birds in their yards and on their properties uh, to, to um, provide a place for these birds to breed, a safe place for these birds to breed. So the Purple Martin Conservation Association is a, a wonderful organization that brings together a lot of these community-based scientists uh, and allows them a forum to uh, share their data and to contribute to this long-term monitoring um, pro uh, project, which has been going on now for over 20 years. And in fact, they have uh, over a million nest records at this point. So there are a lot of people that are involved um, with this project. So if you are a Purple Martin landlord and you are not involved with the Purple Martin Conservation Association, I definitely encourage you to look them up uh, and to participate and share your data to um, contribute to our understanding of Purple Martins. So Purple Martins are here in Florida and across much of the United States in the summertime when they're breeding. <coughs> they arrive here in Florida as early as late December and into early January. And at that point, they're scouting and they're hanging out, uh, foraging, checking out potential nest sites, but you won't necessarily see them uh, spending any time at the housing areas other than just checking them out. Uh, once they get serious about finding a nest site, uh, they'll start spending the night in the nest um, in the nesting gourd, and it'll be obvious that they, they're starting the nest building. So the reason we know the timing or the phenology of migration and breeding for these birds are through these great community-based science programs such as eBird, which we talked about earlier, uh, and the Purple Martin Conservation Association. Uh, so the, the PMCA runs a scout arrival study that one can participate in. So when the birds first start arriving, um, the, the PMCA really encourages folks to report those first sightings so that we can see and track the movement of these birds across the breeding area. And this has been going on for, the, again, uh, over 20 years and lots and lots of data have been collected. So I just blew up here um, central Florida to to show everyone that, and I should have extended this map a little bit, of course, um, but to show you all that well, it's actually kind of sparse here in Florida. And so I really encourage folks to get out there, look for the Martins and, um, and to report them when you see them arriving. So observational studies are super important, but another way that we can gather these data are through tracking studies where, um, um, satellite tags or, or um, geolocators and radio telemetry tags can be added to these birds so that we can actually track them during their migration and see in, in um, real time uh, where they're going and when they're going. So that's a little bit of background on the natural history of the Purple Martin. So I wanna switch gears a little bit now to tell you about my uh, lab group here at UCF and the things that we're doing. Uh, our, our group is relatively new. The Purple Martin project here has been going since uh, spring 2020. So this is our, our second field season, but I would like to say it's our first official field season since COVID kind of put a wrench into everything last year. So th these are the folks that are in my lab. Uh, Lauren is a, a senior undergraduate student working on a radio telemetry study and she's going off to grad school at uh, South Carolina here in the fall. Um, Christine is uh, also a senior. She's been with me the longest. She actually works on uh, sea turtles. So she doesn't work on birds at all. Although she, uh, um, she puts up with a lot of the bird talk <laughs> in our lab. Uh, she is instead looking, using DNA um, methods to look at the diet composition of sea turtles. Uh, Julia, oh, actually everybody's a senior at this point or has already graduated. Julia and Isabella, both seniors. Uh, Julia is working on a project looking at ectoparasites in the Purple Martin nests. Uh, she's also uh, conducting a project where she's using radar to look for roost locations and roost behaviors over time. Um, Isabella is a pre-vet student 
And uh, before joining my lab, she was an intern at the Audubon Raptor Center in Maitland. And so she's very, very interested in uh, clinical approaches. And she's been keeping busy in the lab looking at blood smear slides that we make from uh, blood samples we collect from the birds, both with scrub jays and now with the purple martins um, to assess health in these birds and to look for blood parasites. Brian is actually graduated, but he's still an active member of our lab. Uh, he uh, is right now uh, working, on a, um, uh, working on a project where he's uh, inventorying uh, rails. So he's out in the field all the time. Uh, Stephanie has graduated, but she's also a very active member of my lab, working primarily on the Purple Martin project. Uh, and Victoria actually works on mealworms. <laughs> she was also a pre-vet student, has graduated but uh, here recently, but um, was looking at uh, microbiome uh, composition in, um, in mealworms. So lots of different projects going on, not necessarily bird projects, uh, but the folks that work with me that are working in other systems are ones that are either interested in bacterial communities associated with, um, with different animals or using DNA techniques to understand diet or some other aspect of um, organismal ecology. So I'm just put out some arrows here um, to show you the folks that have been involved with our Nighthawk Audubon chapter. So this is the UCF campus chapter that was established in 2019. Um, and uh, it's a, been a really great group, even though they've had a, had a little bit of a rough go at it since the start because of COVID, um, they still are very active. In fact, they received one of the National Audubon Society's Burke grants. And so, just a few weeks ago, they kicked that off on Arbor Day. Um, so they were given a $10,000 grant to establish a bird-friendly garden and bird-friendly uh, uh, plantings here in collaboration with the Arboretum and UCF. So great group of folks. And all of them have been involved with the UCF Purple Martin Project, which as I mentioned, was started last spring. And so we have 12 houses or 12 gourd racks around campus with a total of 144 gourds. So these arrived here on campus early February last year and um, we all got together and set these up. The actual gourd rack is located about 16 uh, feet up in the air and we can attach as many as 18 gourds to each gourd rack or each house. Um, each house is equipped with a predator guard to make sure that we don't have any um, climbing predators getting up into those gourd racks. And so I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor, but <laughs> what I'm pointing at here is the actual gourd rack where my students are putting the gourds up here. And the gourd rack right now is in the lowered position. And then we have a hand crank here at the bottom and a winch system that allows us to crank that entire, um, that entire gourd rack up into the air where the birds prefer for them to be. <coughs> the gourds themselves that we use are these horizontal gourds, again, that provides protection um, uh, from those aerial predators. Here are two of my students, this is Lauren and Julia, as they're setting up those, those gourds. And so we actually um, add pine, clean pine straw, clean dry pine straw to each of the gourds so that the birds have a little bit of substrate to start with at the beginning of the field season. And during that first field season in 2020, uh, noticed no face masks. So this was actually before COVID um, really took hold. We ran an experiment where we actually only put pine straw into half of the gourds uh, to see what the birds preferred. And it was an overwhelming <laughs> re response for pine straw. There was only one nest that was built in a gourd that didn't have pine straw. So uh, we decided from then on that we would put pine straw in all of the houses. So that's what we do now. And that's also what's recommended by the PMCA. So it's very standard for Purple Martin landlords to do this. 
So we put up these 12 houses and then we all left for spring break <laughs> and waited for those Martins to arrive. Uh, we put up several decoys at each house and we also put up those speakers. And so uh, I, I was still here and uh, running out every couple of days to exchange the batteries and those in <laughs> the battery packs in those uh, speakers to keep them going. When we came back from spring break, uh, the birds had found us. Uh, and so we had a whole bunch of birds at, a, at not all of our houses, but three or four of the houses um, had some activity. But unfortunately, uh, the students didn't come back after spring break because of COVID. And so all of our plans for the field season were, were put on hold. And so unfortunately, the students were not able to participate in that very first field season. But I live here close by to campus, so I came uh, on a regular basis to check out the activity. And, and although we didn't do any banding or anything like that, uh, we could I could at least monitor to see um, this, the success rate of these guys. So we ended up getting 12 nesting pairs and a total of um, 50 fledglings, which I think is great for the first year. We had no idea if we were gonna be able to attract any birds at all. And so the fact that we were able to get 12 nesting pairs is great. I will tell you right now, it's we're busy in the middle of um, Purple Martin season right now. And we currently have 40 nests with eggs in them. So from 12 nesting pairs last year to 40, I think um, is a great success. So we're super excited now. We actually had the first uh, nest hatch today. I, right before the talk, I ran out to, to do a nest check. And so that first, uh, that first nest that had four eggs in it, and when I checked it today, it had three chicks and one egg that had not hatched yet. So this is when the fun begins and um, we will start uh, banding these birds and collecting various types of samples from them this um, this season now to address some of the research questions that we have. I in included this <laughs> this picture for fun here. This was my research assistant last year and my students couldn't be on campus. This is my, uh, well, he was seven then, he's eight now. My eight-year-old son um, is often with me out in the field doing those nest checks. Um, so it's important to have good good help in the field. So regardless of the the uh, field season not really working out the way that we had expected last year, I still think that it was a great success. Um, the Purple Martin Conservation Association was very gracious in helping us getting everything set up. Um, they ran a uh, we made the front front cover of their spring uh, magazine, and um, uh, I would feel like. Uh, it was a good start, all things considered. But we have lots of exciting ideas going forward. Of course, I don't have time to talk about all of those tonight. Um, but uh, this, these are some of the types of projects that we're working on going forward. Uh, I really want to talk to you guys about foraging ecology because I've already mentioned a couple times that folks in my lab are interested in understanding diet composition, specifically using DNA techniques, um, not just in Purple Martins, but in, in sea turtles. So this is one project that we have been working on for the last two years, actually even before we started the Purple Martin project, is, is understanding what the birds are actually eating. And so the way that we do this is by collecting uh, fecal material from the birds. So uh, birds, especially nestlings, are very willing to, to deposit fecal samples. So they're very easy to collect. Um, and there's lots of great information in these, um, these types of samples. So let me explain what I mean um, by using DNA to understand uh, diet composition. I realize this is not a purple martin, <laughs> but uh, this chicken will, will walk us through how this, um, this technique works. Um, and the, uh, the term for this technique is called DNA metabarcoding. And so what we're doing here is that we're trying to understand this mixed sample, this mixed composition of diet that the bird is ingesting from its environment. Um, and so the bird will eat a whole bunch of different bugs, in this case for purple martins. Uh, they'll be digested and come out on the other side as a fecal sample, which we can collect. 
Well, the fecal sample contains all those bug parts that were not digested, including lots of great DNA. Um, and so if we can isolate that DNA and sequence it, we can use that DNA for forensics, basically, to, to figure out what insects make up that diet. There are lots of other things in fecal samples that are of interest to, of course, bacterial DNA. I've already mentioned the microbiome and my own interest in understanding bacterial communities. So this type of um, DNA we can also extract from, um, from fecal samples to understand the gut microbiome composition. Um, also parasite DNA, um, we can sequence that as well to understand the gut parasites that these birds are, um, are living with. So once we collect these fecal samples, we bring them back to the lab and extract that DNA and then sequence them on a DNA sequencer, which we actually have one now at UCF so we can do all of this work in-house, which is really exciting. So this is the team that's been working on this particular project, the DNA metabarcoding project to, to look at Cobalt Martin diet, not just here in Florida, but actually at two other sites across the breeding range, including Erie, Pennsylvania, and up in um, Manitoba. And so uh, I have a couple folks uh, pictured here, including myself, and then my, my former student, Stephanie, as I mentioned, is still a very active person in my lab. Uh, Joe Segrist is the president of the Purple Martin Conservation Association, uh, which is based out of Erie, Pennsylvania. And so he contributed samples to the study too, as well as Kevin Frazier, um, who is up in Manitoba. And then Jason Fisher is a close collaborator of mine. He works for Disney Conservation. So he's here locally. Um, I was actually out there just this morning. Their birds uh, are um, in full swing right now. And so there was a lot of banding and sample taking today uh, and tomorrow and basically every other, every other day of this week and uh, <laughs> in the next. And then Brandon Hainig uh, is a, a PhD student up in uh, Pennsylvania also, and he is very interested in using DNA to understand um, uh, diet composition. So he's been super helpful making sense of all that DNA sequence data and actually figuring out from that who's who of those insects. So let me share with you what we found so far. Here's a compilation of bugs. Um, so again, these are these are not pictures I took. These are pictures um, uh, for those, uh, those bug species that we were able to figure out by looking at those DNA sequences. <coughs> Lots of moths, um, which we might expect. We know that um, purple martins really like moths and butterflies and um, um, uh, uh, they're, they're very well known for dragonflies. They really love those dragonflies. Lots of crane flies showed up too, lots of midges. A um, couple of bot flies, uh, actually an ant, uh, midges, um, some aphids and lace wings, <coughs> some beetles. Oh, here's that dragonfly. Um, Damsel flies, crane flies, um, some various types of, of beetles and, and other flies. So I thought this might be a little bit more interesting to show you the pictures of those bugs that we um, detected in, in the diet. But if you wanted to see this data or these data in, um, uh, in a uh, figure form here, I've broken down the frequency of, of occurrence. So if we look at the, the samples that were collected in Erie, and Orlando and Winnipeg, how fre frequently within those samples we saw these different types of, um, of insects. And so the larger the bar is, uh, the more common that insect type was for that particular site. So here we can clearly see that the dipterans or the flies were the most common across Erie, Orlando, and Winnipeg. And we can see, not surprisingly, that Odonata, so these are the dragonflies and the damselflies, uh, were also very common across those three sites. So there's definitely a lot of similarities, but we also see a lot of really interesting differences. So um, for example, here in Orlando, 
uh, we see quite a bit of Hymenoptera. These are the bees, ants, and wasps. Whereas in Erie, we didn't pick up any of that. And in Winnipeg, that was also um, not very common. Um, Erie, on the other hand, had a lot of Coleoptera or beetles, whereas Orlando and the Winnipeg sites did not have as much of that. Uh, whereas the Winnipeg site has had quite a few caddis flies. So about 25% of the samples, those fecal samples collected from Winnipeg had caddis fly DNA, whereas none of the samples from Erie or Orlando um, had, had caddis fly DNA. So um, this just goes to show that just collecting those fecal samples, we can learn so much about the composition of the diet and, and sort of that foraging ecology of these birds. So this was a, an initial study to kind of work out the methods and to get an idea about some of that um, variation across the site. And we're super excited now to, to move forward and to expand on this work going forward. So this is definitely something that we're gonna continue with in my lab. Another exciting project that we're working on here at UCF is um, setting up a MODIS wildlife tracking system tower here on campus. Um, right now we're trying to figure out exactly where we're going to be putting this tower, but we have, um, we have 25 tags already. We have 10 more on the way. So we will be tagging birds this season. Um, we just need to get our radio telemetry tower up and, and situated and ready to go so that we can track these birds and their behaviors and movements across campus and between the, the different houses that we have set up here, but also so that we can follow them to see uh, when they're leaving for migration and when they're returning, hopefully returning um, in the spring again. So this is very a very exciting project um, spearheaded by my student Lauren, Lauren Puleo, um, again, who's going off to grad school to continue tracking actually Hudsonian godwits. Uh, the MODIS network is actually a really exciting um, uh, program. And so there are these towers located all over the world, although I've just shown you the map here of um, North America and Florida specifically. Um, but these towers allow us to track birds. And so the, the trackers that the birds have, these little tracking backpacks, they uh, emit a signal that is picked up by these um, towers so that we can follow when the birds uh, are migrating. And so we can look at on a large spatial scale, or if you have uh, uh, more of these uh, sensor nodes in an area, you can actually look at smaller um, scale movement, which is what we're hoping to do here at UCF. Another project that we're working on right now and that will continue on for at least another season is um, thinking about ectoparasites. And so if you are a Purple Martin landlord or you know someone who is a Purple Martin landlord, especially here in Florida, you are quite aware that um, Purple Martins tend to attract a lot of ectoparasites, specifically these little mites. Um, <clears throat> by the time the nestlings are between 15 and 20 days old, there can be tons of these ectoparasites in the nest. And so we're really interested in seeing how these ectoparasites actually affect the health and condition of the nestlings and the adults. And we're also interested in understanding how um, ectoparasite remediation uh, techniques can uh, influence the health of the birds. And so there are a lot of purple martin landlords out there that use um, seven dust, which is uh, an insecticide that can be purchased at Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, and it's very commonly used. However, it's actually um, uh, not approved for use by the EU. It's not approved for use uh, by India. It was just, um, outlawed in California last year. And there's quite some evidence that points towards uh, neurological effects, especially for developing uh, organisms. And so we're really interested in, in getting into that a little bit more and understanding what the effects of using seven dust is, not just on the mite populations, but also on um, 
the nestling condition and their behaviors after they leave the nest because we don't really know very much about that and that's definitely something that's really important um, especially as initial evidence seems to point at the fact that these um, mites don't seem to have uh, extensive negative effects on these birds. So lots coming out of this. Hopefully this will this is our first season uh, working on this. So we'll have to update you uh, on what we find going forward. Another fun, fun project we hear, have here at UCF um, that relates to the Purple Martins is in collaboration with the UCF Arboretum student interns. And so this last year, they actually planted these gourds, the Purple Martin gourds, uh, that they've been growing in, um, uh, in the Arboretum, which is kind of fun. So lots of different projects happening uh, relating to Purple Martins here at UCF. Uh, the other one is, of course, the Orlando Wetlands Park Survey. So this is the uh, Purple Patrol uh, project. And again, we are always looking for volunteers. So if you are someone who likes to come out to Orlando Wetlands Park, which is an amazing place to go bird watching in general, um, we would love to have your help. Um, you can look my website up if you don't want to <laughs> write down this uh, website address. You can just Google uh, me at uh, UCF and you can click your way to the Purple Patrol project uh, if you want to contribute. There are lots of great pictures also if you're interested in seeing more pictures uh, on the Purple Martin project and the installation um, and sort of the progress of that project. We have lots of those on the website as well. So lots of exciting things happening um, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to, to share them with you this evening. And I look forward to the opportunity to speak with you again sometime in the future and update you um, as this project develops. So that is all I have, and I'd be more than happy to take questions. That fantastic talk, I appreciate it so much. Uh, I learned so much myself. I, I oh, actually good. am a geneticist, but I was pre, uh, DNA uh, studies, and so I was working with genes, but you've done so much more is pretty incredible. The I do have a couple questions. The first question I had is, do the Purple Martins migrate um, north up one path and back a different one, or are they pretty much along the same route? Oh gosh, that's a great question. And so there is a, a bit of variation in in uh, migration routes, um, but I think they tend to follow with that map that I showed earlier was of one individual. And so I think they tend to follow um, similar paths, maybe not exactly. And also the, the speed and time that it takes is not necessarily the same. And I should say too, that I am definitely not an expert when it comes to migration. And so if I had my student Lauren here, she'd be much better at answering that question. <laughs> Um, the next question I have is, how do you see into the nests to count the eggs, et cetera? So, um, yes, the gourds have this lid right here, the screw cap lid. And so you just pull that off. See, uh, my son's holding the lid here, and then he's he's peering down into um, the nest cavity there. And this is the, op Ooh. This is the opening where the birds come through. And okay. it looks kind of odd that opening right it's very narrow and the reason for that is that it's a starling proof uh, entrance okay. and so the round entrances will allow the starlings to get in we don't have tons of starlings on campus, but we do have a flock that tends to move around. So uh, the Purple Martins don't have any problems getting in and out of these uh, openings, but the starlings are excluded. The ones that are not excluded are the, um, are the house sparrows, mm -hmm. which can be really problematic, but luckily uh, we haven't had any issues yet so we will cross that bridge when we get to it <laughs> um this question i'm not sure if this was in response to the seven dust uh why would you use a highly toxic chemical on the young of species you know very little about especially if the parasite you are trying to eliminate doesn't seem to be a problem for them perhaps the parasite prevents some other critter from in invading so this is definitely a contentious issue uh, and so I, 
of. I think that folks are very worried about the birds being as healthy as possible, which is understandable. As a Purple Martin landlord, you would want to do the very best for your birds. They almost become family. You know, they're coming back from year to year and breeding in the same site. And so you want them to have a good, good living conditions. And it is kind of distressing to see so many mites, right, crawling on the outside of the nest uh, gourd and all over the chicks. Um, it is quite distressing. And so uh, it has become, although the PMCA does not recommend putting anything into the nests, um, it has become uh, pretty common among Purple Martin landlords to do that um, at various rates. Um, and the seven dust I think has, bec has been used because it is available at Lowe's Home Depot. And it is generally assumed to be uh, safe. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the scientific evidence doesn't necessarily support that a hundred percent and so that's why we want to go in and really test that with the birds uh, and hoping that providing some some rigorous scientific evidence will help clarify some of these questions and are um, you testing to see if the seven dust is good or if the parasites are okay so both we're doing okay. both at the, at the same time to see if there are any negative effects of the parasites on the birds and to look at if there are any negative effects of the seven dust on the birds and so we are taking lots of different measures of health and condition of the nestlings while they're in the nest and also the parents and we're putting trackers on uh, the birds, the nestlings, so when they fledge, we can follow their behavior after they fledge, which is something that hasn't been done previously. And yeah. so, um, especially because the seven dust seems to, if it has any effects, it seems to be neurologically based effects. Okay. We may not really see that in the nest because the birds don't have to move very much. They're just right. sitting there and eating. Uh, so if there are any neurological effects, we may not see it until they after they've left the nest, mm -hmm. which is hard to to address. And so that's what we're hoping to do with those trackers. What, what and... is the uh, let me enter, what is the life cycle of these mites? Do, how do they get in there? And do you know? Any more about them? Yeah, so, well, at least with our gourds, with these plastic gourds, we clean them out between each season. And so there shouldn't be any mites that overwinter in these gourds. However, in maybe wooden boxes that can't be cleaned out the same way that these uh, gourds can be, some of the mites, uh, some of the ectoparasites may overwinter in, um, uh, in those cavities. Uh, but otherwise these mites are coming in on the adults and then they they grow very very quickly once they get in and get in those nestlings question i believe i have read that the purple martins feed primarily in the evening where do they go during the day are they constantly on the wing or do they roost they do roost and they do hang out all around the house uh, while they're obviously while they're nest building and uh, so the house that I have at home that I look at all the time now where the female is incubating the male is often sitting on top of the house um, and just I may be keeping a lookout but otherwise they're out foraging a lot of the time so they'll be out for long periods of time and then they'll come back to the house at uh, once they've selected a housing um, uh, cavity both male and female will actually sleep well they'll roost in that cavity and so that's one of the ways that we're able to trap the adults to ban them because okay. we can do overnight trapping wonderful you did a terrific job you educated us <laughs> about these purple martins that I, things that I didn't even have any idea that was going on. So uh, thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was fun to chat with everybody and, and hopefully next time it'll be in person. Yep, and we'd, we'd love to have you come down and visit us sometime when you're down here in Bureau Beach. I would love that, that would be great.